Wonderful. So welcome. Welcome to London. Welcome to BMA House and welcome to the 2023 Mission Oriented Innovation Network gathering. It's wonderful to have you all here with us today. This gathering is taking part as part of the IIPP's festival, the Entrepreneurial State 2.0, rethinking the state in the 21st century. A big welcome also to those people online. So my name is Nora Clinton and I am head of the Mission Oriented Innovation Network at IIPP at University College London and I will host you over the next few days through these days together. So what is MOIN? The Mission Oriented Innovation Network is the Institute for Innovation and Public Purposes policy network and learning platform which brings together global public sector organizations to share the challenges and opportunities that they face when stepping outside of a market fixing box into a market shaping role to tackle 21st century challenges. MOIN is a place of convening, exchange and mutual learning between academia and policy actors on mission oriented innovation practice. So we're delighted today to have approximately or representation from approximately 60 members in, our, in the room and also online. And many of you have traveled from afar, so thank you for coming. Over the next day and a half, we're going to explore together the state of play of mission oriented innovation through certain lenses, through the lens of industrial policy to state capacity to public sector organizational design and other new tools and approaches such as new forms of dynamic assessment and evaluation to assess transformative, transformative policies. But just before we start, a couple of housekeeping rules. So there are, in case of fire, there are green signs above the door. Please follow those for fire exits. And we've been asked to say by BMA House that if anyone feels unwell, please don't hesitate to reach out. So at this point, I would like to welcome to the lectern Professor Mariana Mazzucato, who is the founding director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, for her welcome address. So I don't feel well. Where do I go? <laughs> I went to the poshest dinner I have ever been at in my life last night at the Royal Academy with all the famous artists, and they managed to poison us. <laughs> so I feel really ill. Hopefully it's not catching. Anyway, welcome. How cool that you're all here. We had our first Mission Oriented Innovation Network meeting five years ago, the same year that we began IAPP, because we're celebrating our fifth anniversary. We also started with MOIN, because MOIN, from now on we'll just call it MOIN, but you all know what it means, Mission Oriented Innovation Network, was really the seed of IAPP. In fact, it was set up before IAPP. So when I was, uh, had hunted to come to UCL from Sussex when that, where I was at Spru, we had already begun setting this up. In fact, we hosted in 2014, way before, a conference called Mission Oriented Innovation Policy, where we brought together many different, again, global organizations to do what then we did in Bellagio, which is to share the difficulties, but also the excitement, so the challenges and opportunities of stepping outside this little narrow box that public actors are allowed to tread in, right? So if at best you're allowed to fix market failures and be really careful not to do much more because then the accusation is you might crowd out all those different kind of, you know, stories and the issues around picking winners, so on and so forth. Actually on the ground, the questions are so much more interesting, right? So how do you actually evaluate policy that is ambitious, that's catalytic, that's trying to do all those cool things that happen on the way to the moon, where all those different problems had to be solved across an economy, across many different sectors. What does a challenge-oriented industrial strategy look like? How is it different from a sector, you know, just giving guarantees and subsidies to, to sectors? What does it look like to do outcomes-oriented procurement, participatory budgeting, all these nitty-gritty things on the ground that are interesting when we think about issues around public value, public purpose, market shaping, not just market fixing. So really what MOIN is about is a learning opportunity to talk, also a therapy session, because <laughs> sometimes I often say that I walk in as an economist and I come out as a life coach because of how many <laughs> problematic uh, structures. I don't have slides, by the way. No. 
Okay, good. Um, I thought maybe you were waiting for me to click. Um, anyway, so you know, it's 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 wonderful. Um, IAPP was actually set up for that reason. So when I wrote the Entrepreneurial State, which is having its 10th anniversary this year, we have a party that you're all coming to tonight, a, a great session around that. I realized that even though the message was being listened to and you know, governments around the world wanted me to come and talk about what is an entrepreneurial state, what does it mean to be an investor first resort, not just the lender of last resort, what does it mean to think about entrepreneurial systems instead of just entrepreneurship as an individual kind of innovator, that actually what really needed to change to make some of those ideas have impact was really kind of a new mindset. So IPP was set up to make a link between these big, bold new ideas about the state as an active investor working in symbiotic ways with different actors around the biggest challenges of our time, around those different issues of what it means, around capabilities, cultural change, new tools, new organizational culture, new ways to share risks and rewards, but it had to be accompanied by a new mindset, which we're very wed to in terms of the curriculum. So one of the best things that IAPP has done in these first five years has been actually to try to rewrite the curriculum in terms of a master's in public administration outside of, again, those silos of market failure th theory, but also the silos of the metrics that are very static, like cost benefit analysis, net present value, and the framing that's come from this kind of old school thinking around public choice theory and new public management. So that really, I would say, if I had to say the thing that makes me proudest <laughs> of the first five years of IAPP is in fact really rethinking that kind of training, the education, but that for us has been fed by the research, and we have some of our PhD students in the room and postdocs as well, around really what do we actually mean when we say that market fixing you know, is, is the static framework? What is a more dynamic framework? What is the nitty gritty of market shaping and market co-creation? And some of these issues we'll be getting into today, but that link between the new theory, the new practice and the new training is uh, uh, what we're very um, wed to. Because otherwise, as you all know, those academics in the room, the usual way, that academics work is they write their papers, they write their books, and at the end they're like, policy conclusions. Hey world, listen to me. Instead, what we've tried to do is actually work with policymakers, people working in different parts of the policy world from the beginning to actually ask more interesting questions in the theory and again, to have that feedback. So for example, tonight we'll be talking with Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister of Scotland who uh, stepped down just uh, some weeks ago about the lessons learned on the ground when we accompanied Scotland in setting up a new public bank, the mission-oriented uh, uh, Scottish National Investment Bank. What we learned about portfolio thinking within a public institution, new ways to think about that risk-reward reward relationship, but also the cultural issues they faced when so many of the civil servants that were hired into the bank had actually been trained to worry about risk in the past. And if you have a mission-oriented investment bank, what does it mean, again, for the kind of uh, uh, ability to actually welcome that kind of risk, but also really focus on the crowding in, not the worry about the crowding out process, but what are also more interesting ways of talking about that catalytic crowding in multiplier effect that a public bank surely needs to do to, to create additionality in the system, right? To actually get business to make those kind of investments that they wouldn't have made otherwise through that mission-oriented investment bank uh, 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 loan program. So the lessons that we learned in that process, we brought back to the theory, but also again to the curriculum. Anyway, I'll stop here just to say that Moin really is set up as a learning network. So we hope that you guys interact as much as possible, not just today and tomorrow, but also here we have Shiva entering from the European Investment Bank, as I just mentioned it. Um, anyway, so I'll hand back over to Nora, who will start us off just introducing the first session, which I will moderate. And then you all have a program, so the day is quite packed. I'm unfortunately in the afternoon, have to step away for something else, but then I'll be back and we'll see each other also tonight. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana. And just to reiterate what Mariana said, so this is a, a platform where we want to make as many connections as possible between you and the room. So you will have received in advance a participant list 
of everyone who's here. So please do reach out to people. And um, we have built in, you know, lunches and some drinks in at IPP this afternoon in order to maximize the time that you you have together. And also, um, you will be seeing some of the students work later when you go to the catering space and coffee space down in the courtyard suite. But we also have some flip charts there with um, questions for you. You know, maybe you have questions that you really want answered. So please put them on the flip uh, board, uh, boards during the day and we will bring them into the discussion. Um, but also maybe you have something you want to offer to this network and um, you can post it on there or maybe you have an ask of this network. So put your thoughts on those charts so that during the day we can track where your thinking is at and what you would like to see happening. So at this stage, we're going to move into our first panel discussion of the day. And this is a panel discussion where we will discuss the potential of industrial policy to steer green growth. Could I please ask for the panelists in the room to come to their seats on the stage? And so that's Alicia. Yes, oh, yes, you did. There we go. Thank you so much. Yes, fantastic. So that's exactly it. So um, our panelists this morning are all up here on the slide. We have Alicia Barcena, and she is currently the Mexican ambassador in Chile and is the former executive secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, or ECLAC. Prior to her time at ECLAC, Ms. Barcena served as the coordinator of the Latin American and Caribbean Sustainable Development Program of the United Nations Development Program, and she's responsible where she was responsible for environmental citizenship project. We have Professor Martin Guzman, who is the Professor of Public Policy at the University of Columbia and former Ministry of the Economy of the Republic of Argentina from 2019 to 2022. He is a research scholar at the Columbia University School of Business and director of the Sovereign Debt Restructuring Program of Columbia University's Initiative for Policy Dialogue. We also have Dr. Muzukizi Kobo, who is an associate professor and head of the school at the Witt School of Governance, University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. He is an expert on political economy, strategy and geopolitics. And over the last 20 years, Dr. Kobo has been an advisor to the decision makers in government and corporate sectors and has been a member of President Cyril Ramaphosa's Economic Advisory Council since 2019. We also have two speakers online. I think they are due to come in. I'm not sure if Stuart is here. Perfect. So they are coming in online now and they are Dr. Nimrod Zalk, who is the Acting Deputy Director General of Industrial Competitiveness and Growth at the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, Republic of South Africa. He sits on the boards of the South African Industrial Development Corporation and Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies. He has been involved in the development and implementation of various South African industrial policy action plans. And finally, we also want to welcome Elizabeth Werner, who is the Deputy Se Secretary General of Policy Coordination at the European Union. Ms. Werner has been working for the European Commission since 1996 in various roles, such as the Head of Cabinet for Budget and Human Resources and Director of Land Transport. And she is currently responsible for policy coordination, including the Green Deal. So that was long introdu introductions, but thank you so much. And at this stage, we'll hand over to Mariana to moderate the panel. And Mariana, I believe you have a microphone there who you can pass along. Thank you so much. People are just coming in online. Thank you. Great. So thanks, Nora. And again, this is really meant to be not speeches, but reflections on the ground. Um, so thank you for all the panel members. Um, I just, I guess, would begin with um, just reflecting on how what IPP has been doing around industrial strategy, again, since we were set up, which is to really, as I mentioned really quickly, transform it from being a sectoral approach to a mission-oriented approach, which means that all sectors actually need to change. And then the question is how? How does that change happen? So one of the things we've reflected on coming back to public banks is what is the institutional structure in a loan program? How does it differ when you actually have a challenge-oriented industrial strategy versus when you're just kind of handing out money to sectors that are saying, help, help. So in Germany, for example, because they had an energy vende policy, which was focused on an energy transition there, that meant that the public bank, the KFW, actually started to have the guts to create conditionalities linked to the loan programs to sectors like the steel sector, which had to reduce its material content of production in order to access that loan 
because the point was not just to save steel, but to help steel transform towards an energy transition. So these are the kind of questions we want to uh, work out in this session. We don't have much time. So really what we'd love to do is to reflect on just experiences, but also challenges, bottlenecks, where the pain points are, why sometimes these new relationships between public and private actors that we need for a mission-oriented industrial strategy are much harder said than done, uh, including you know, issues around lobbying to, to prevent that. Um, so I think actually I might just start with the, the circle here and, and then we'll go to the, is, is, is that okay, Nora, or is there a fixed order? Uh, because Alicia, and I actually have been talking for a long time in her position uh, before as the head of the UN Economics Commission for Latin America. A lot of the work that CEPAL has done over the years has been around industrial strategy, but again, not just the static industrial strategy, but a new form in, of industrial strategy. And we had the honor of working with CEPAL last year where we, um, uh, IAPP presented a report on what a challenge-oriented industrial strategy might help do in Latin America, especially around issues around, for example, the resource curse, right? Lithium in Argentina <laughs> is both a solution in terms of electric cars, but also a problem in terms of it being an extractive sector. So what does that look like from a challenge-oriented industrial strategy to think about uh, electrification, for example? Anyway, so why don't we just start with Alicia and then we'll, we'll go, um, how many minutes does everyone have just as an opening statement? three to five minutes, yeah? And then we'll, after everyone does their three minute uh, opening, uh, we'll then have a conversation, yeah? So Alicia. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Mariana. Good morning to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here today. And uh, happy to talk a little bit about what's happening in the region I come from, which is Latin America and the Caribbean. I think that we, uh, we are confronting multiple crises, as everybody is. And basically, I think one of them is the fiscal crisis in a way, because uh, many the majority of the governments of the region are confronting the fact that they should need to have a, a fiscal policy and a, 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 even a tax reform. But the governments, uh, I wouldn't say the governments, I would say the society is not ready for that. And the parliamentarians, and there's a lot of confrontation between the government and the parliaments to get a, a tax reform and a tax re why am I talking about this is because if we want to do an industrial policy, there are things that the state will need to do, not only the private sector. So that's, that's number one in the sense that austerity has been there, the, uh, the fiscal reforms are very difficult and, and very small when they go through, like the one that happened in Colombia, but definitely Mexico is not ready for that. Mexico is talking about tax evasion and tax elusion as a way of fiscal reform, which is okay. They have been able to, to get a, a sort of a 0.8% of GDP out of the tax evasion, very forceful policy. Now, when we talk about industrial policy, I think that the new way of thinking of in industrial policy, as you have done, transformative, is to think about uh, the complementarity between industrial policy and social and sustainability policies. Cannot be on, on, on its own anymore. For example, yesterday, just to, as an anecdote, I was sitting with, a, not yesterday, day before yesterday, I was sitting with a candidate that will probably win the next presidential election. It's a woman. Uh, Claudia Sheinbaum, and we were talking precisely about what she, she's the mayor, and well, she is one of the candidates. But, but I think that we were talking precisely about what type of industrial policy a country like Mexico needs right now. And let me put you that example because with the with the uh, the, the the free trade agreement that was signed and the nearshoring and that is happening because it's really happening many companies are coming to mexico to invest because because it's closer to the markets or because it's the the value chains are nearer and as you know there was a big crisis and a disruption of value chain uh, especially in semiconductors and electromobility and, and automobiles so mexico is, is is a very attractive place for this now but if we want an industrial policy really in Mexico, a country that, by the way, there was one guy who said that the best industrial policy was the one that didn't exist. So how do we, how do we really formulate an industrial policy that 
has at least, I would say, some elements. Number one, that is uh, regionally directed in the sense that territorially goes to the, those places. It doesn't come anywhere of the country. Now the country, I think, and the government is in a moment that they can select where do they want to place that industrial policy or that development or that investment and how is it it is connected with the local community, number one. How is that going to help to create employment and to innovate in the place that you are or to bring value added to the place where you are? Because traditionally in Latin America and the Caribbean, Martin, you will probably talk about that, we come from extractivism, from extractive industries, particularly in South America. So the investment and the industries are where placed basically in the 70s, the 80s and 90s, etc., where the minerals are, either copper or, or silver or lithium right now. So what has changed then? If we want to give value added to that instead of this industrialization, which is what happened in the 80s, if we want to come back, then we have to be seriously thinking, first of all, about the territory, I mean, to, to, to really make sure that we are going to the places where this is most needed, not necessarily linked to natural resources. It could be linked, for example, in the case of Mexico, to electric cars, which is something that they want to sell uh, outside to the US, for example. So what are those sectors? And, and indeed, I agree with you that there should not be only a sectoral approach, but there's no question that the governments and the public sector will have to be investors in a way, entrepreneurs, to bring about some um, investment, to pull in money that should go to certain parts of the territory. So one of the things that the government of Mexico did in these past uh, four years was to invest in the south, which, which is the poorest part of the, of the country, and then to bring to the, to the south infrastructure and to bring facilities and, and, and actually to bring basic needs there so industrial policies could be then well organized in the territory. It's easy, easily said than done because what you need is a mission. What's your mission? You want to go to the south because it's the poorest part of the country. Secondly, you want to do it without uh, destroying the environment. You want to do it sustainably. Yeah, easy said but done because there's no, the innovation is not there. We need to move into energy efficiency uh, ways of doing this, etc. And the other thing we want it to be socially important, and that is to generate employment, employment that is formal and not informal. And again, this is another question. So my ma basic point is that there has to be complementarity between industrial, social and sustainability policies, and that we are in a moment where this is more possible than ever. Thank you, Alicia. Um, just to warn you, I'm going to go to Mizzou, then I'm going to go to Elizabeth. So I, so I do uh, woman, man, woman, man. <laughs> anyway, just also not to penalize the people on screen to have to wait too long. Mizzou, we have a, a project uh, together where we're thinking about industrial strategy in terms of actually shaping it so it helps to direct growth so that growth is more inclusive and sustainable, right? So also the, all the issues around the just economic transition, which you know is also very important to global labor unions um, to make sure that labor is not left behind. But of course, that's not enough. We need labor's voice at the table ex ante. Any reflections on what it means to actually have an industrial strategy that's inclusive and sustainable, what it means, for example, for the role of state on enterprises, changes, and their behaviors, again, whether it's public loan programs, but also the, the capital labor relationship, which is so uh, uh, central to any form of, of growth, if we actually shape it to uh, not to increase inequality, but reduce it in a country like South Africa, where inequality is so high. Sure, thanks, um, uh, Mariana. The, uh, the more I think about this, it's clear to me that um, industrial policy needs to or industrial strategy broadly needs to uh, to play a leading role in directing uh, structural change in society and also in um, identifying those areas uh, that um, require the, great, the, great, the greatest interventions to solve uh, socio-economic challenges, uh, to create uh, new opportunities in, in green sectors, um, 
but also to bring uh, a, a great sense of uh, convergence around, uh, you know, the the goals uh, that different actors uh, should pursue. And and in this respect, you uh, you know, talking about uh, social social co compact or social contract. Now, in the past, uh, you know, the way we've thought about, I mean, broadly, um, countries have thought about uh, industrial policies. It's it's been in terms of uh, top-down, um, sort of very linear approach. It's it's about the state um, disciplining the markets and the state doing everything, um, you know, providing subsidies, tax credits, and uh, identifying uh, the, the winners and picking the winners. Um, and, and, and I think that that thinking has been changing uh, with the uh, you know, growing emphasis on strategic collaboration between the state and the market. Uh, and and I think after your work on the entrepreneurial state, uh, the idea that uh, the state and the market can uh, play a co-reinforcing co role uh, where they both co-create and co-shape new opportunities, especially in, in, in new sectors. Now, I mean, Nimrod is going to say quite a lot about uh, how this plays itself out and, and how he, as the main driver of uh, the country's industrial policies, thinking about um, uh, these shifts. Uh, in the context of our work, uh, which is looking at uh, green energy transitions, um, you know, for many of you who know South Africa, it's, uh, you know, historically a country that is characterized by social tensions, race-based tensions, uneven development across different races, across different sectors of society and, and uh, divergences that, are, that cut across regions. Um, so I, my sense is that uh, it, it is not enough to think about uh, industrial policy and social development uh, at a meta level in a sort of broad, uh, and, and general sense, we, we we have to also conceive of the role of uh, cities and provinces uh, elsewhere, they call regions, uh, as low key of, of development because they have different characteristics. So one locality is different from the other. And one of the areas we're looking at, for an example, is the, the one that is affected by, is going to be affected by decarbonization, where the bulk of uh, you know, the, the coal assets uh, are based and, and where most of the coal-fired power stations are, the, the Mpumalanga area. Uh, and in the past, we've had a transition of sorts in the mining sector. And what we've seen is that whenever there is a transition that is, you know, the life of a mine, uh, the, the mine reach, you know, the end of its life, those uh, communities that are in mining areas become, uh, you know, they, they get caught up in abject poverty, they become more marginalized, social frictions intensify, you know, uh, criminality uh, rises uh, and, and, and many other ills. So we, we've got to be careful in how we think about green transition, uh, not to reproduce uh, some of these social tensions that come from from the past, and perhaps one one point to to also note, um, uh, last point to to note, uh, and and I think we'll come back to to some of these points, is that the world is interconnected. So we we globally integrated. So all countries, every country is pursuing industrial policy, a green industrial policy. You know, Japan, uh, the UK is talking about one, the EU. Uh, you know, the, the, the new green uh, deal, uh, the US, the Inflation Reduction Act. And there's a danger that uh, we may find ourselves in a race to the bottom with subsidies and, and tax credits uh, and a configuration of uh, new ways of, uh, you know, driving green innovation that is centered on the, you know, transatlantic alliances and, and the G7 in ways that exclude uh, African countries uh, that are producing many of uh, these minerals, you know, the critical raw materials. I mean, the EU has formulated this paper on critical raw materials act, uh, which potentially could have many African countries that may want to tap into 
the critical raw materials uh, to uh, you know to drive their own green supply chains, uh, you know, electric vehicle components, uh, or produce nascent solar panels, et, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to think both locally and globally in, in understanding ways in which we want to uh, redistribute opportunities as we all move towards uh, green innovation. So industrial policy, yes, it's great that uh, countries are moving towards sort of green industrial policies, but they also need to understand the harm uh, or unintended harm they may cause to, to other countries. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to go to Elizabeth and just to prompt um, you, Elizabeth, it's interesting, Mizzou, that you just talked about, you know, something like industrial policy, which, you know, as, as we're saying, is actually back. It's no longer a blasphemy and we can talk about a, a redesign, and not just a sector focus, but this kind of challenge orientation, even when it's done well, has global systemic effects that are often very problematic. So in the US, we have the CHIPS Act today, which for the US is actually mm -hmm. quite progressive because it's not just 400 billion handed out to semiconductor companies, it's actually embedded within that different types of conditionalities that we, by the way, in IPP help to uh, design. So conditions around limiting share buybacks by companies, using energy efficient supply chains, improving working conditions and worker pay. So the opportunity to actually design within an industrial strategy conditions that help to steer that growth, again, to be inclusive and sustainable is, is an opportunity. But we know that the CHIPS Act is having very unintended or perhaps intended consequences globally in terms of what's happening to capital flight in Latin America and Africa towards the US because of those subsidies. So maybe Elizabeth, if you can just help us think a bit about what's happening in Europe, where like the Biden administration, there's a two trillion uh, Euro uh, uh, next gen uh, recovery act, but also specifically in terms of green, there's a green deal industrial plan that kind of sits uh, to the side of that. If you can just help us think about what are the design challenges to make sure that a green industrial strategy also really touches on those pain points that we've experienced in Europe um, in terms of, again, inequality and difficult public-private relationships in many Southern European countries, for example, where I'm from in Italy, where there's often a parasitic public-private <laughs> relationship, not a symbiotic one. Good morning and many thanks for the opportunity. Obviously, the Oops. the sense of public policy is something that resonates very well with the EU. And um, for the last 30 years, our economic policy has been driven by the single market. Single market as the engine for growth and for our businesses to grow, which was essentially about bringing down the barriers and having um, free movement of uh, goods, people, services um, across the different member states. And that has brought economies of scale and facilitated businesses to grow and it has also helped us being very resilient. But you asked specifically about the new paradigm and about the new green growth. So let me elaborate briefly on this. Um, for us in the European Commission, it started in 2019 when Ursula von der Leyen became the president and we launched the European Green Deal with our vision to become climate neutral continent by 2050. And we have underpinned this um, ambition first and foremost by legal targets. So we have put this um, objective of climate neutrality in the climate law. That was the first thing that happened. And, and sending thereby a very strong signal to companies, but also to society at large to play their role. We have then come up um, with a set of a comprehensive and interdependent legal proposals. They were centering among, around the emission trading, but they concern energy, agriculture, transport, taxation, um, as I said, the carbon markets, there were targets, there were rules for the business behavior, and there was also sustainable finance rules coming in with the do no significant harm and the taxonomy that should direct not only public, but also private finance towards these sustainable objectives. We also have, um, and you mentioned that, quite a strong public EU budget finance underpinning for this 
And in particular, we have 250 billion euro from the recovery and resilience facility that was set up in the aftermath of COVID, which is a kind of European built back better. And what it does is linking investment with reform. And I think that's a very crucial concept here because we wanted to make sure that we get the most from the public spending, that it is accompanied by the regulatory reform, by the procurement reform, by the taxation reform, etc., etc., to get more out of the money. Our investment there was mostly focused on deployment, on deployment of green sustainable technology. Um, so, and this is what we set out to do and this is what we rolled out and we have made a lot of progress in having the legislation adopted where we're actually nearly there. But then came Russia's uh, war of aggression against Ukraine and the energy crisis that it triggered, uh, our over-reliance on Russian gas imports and on fossil fuels in general, which make us think again and it puts the energy transition very much as the structural solution of our transition and and actually um, ac needs to accelerate on our side the um, renewable energy deployment our early indicators prove us right because last year we have overachieved on energy savings on renewable energy deployment despite a war being waged on our doorsteps, millions of refugees being welcomed, the European economy has been growing. So it seems to work as an industrial plan. Of course, it's early days after one year to judge. But clearly, we are in this industrial transition for the longer run. And, and so here we come to the Green Deal industrial plan, which was presented earlier this year. And there are four key pillars in that industrial plan. First of all, why we focus on clean tech, it's because it's a growth sector and we have a strong industry and a strong innovation in the area. We want to remain in the first league. But equally, we want to not only do the innovation, we want to scale up production. Um, we also see that as of today, we have quite a strong dependence again on imports I don't know, the classic example would be solar panels. So more than 70% we take from Southeast Asia, but it is crucial for our energy transition. So we want to seize this opportunity and turn innovation into a mass production and therefore also sort of redirect some of the public financing, not only in the deployment, but actually in the manufacturing capacity. For that, we're looking into setting up a fast regulatory environment. So permitting, for instance, has been a crucial element in what we have been doing. Um, we also need, and as a second pillar, the workforce. Um, in the EU today, we, we suffer from skill shortages from, from actually there's a more vacancies. Um, and, and as I said, this is a gross areas. So we need to reskill and upskill people. We, we probably need to think as well um, about mobilizing more uh, labor force, um, the young, the elderly. Um, we might even need a more active um, policy um, to take in workers from outside the EU. We also need to think about the raw materials and Professor Gobois mentioned that because it's an essential ingredient for that sector, not only for that sector, but for the clean tech in particular. We need to have strong and competitive supply chains. So trade, trade and competition is essential for that. That's where we also have been comparing, of course, with the US Inflation Reduction Act. Um, same, same kind of objective, but different way of going about this. Um, on our side, um, we are country neutral. And in doing this, we want to do it in partnership with like-minded countries around the globe, because obviously, um, as was already mentioned, um, if we are in a subsidy race or in a race to the bottom, then um, this is not going to be helpful for the planet as a whole. I look very much forward to the discussion and I hope we'll have an opportunity to elaborate a bit more. Back to you.
Thank you, Elizabeth. And it'd be good also later, maybe even um, in the discussions that we have in the next couple of days on the lessons in Europe where, for example, the missions instrument that IPP helped devise ended up just staying within the the uh, Directorate for Innovation, Science and Technology, so RTD, it wasn't actually really brought up to the cabinet level to help steer the green industrial strategy, which in some ways you are doing, but the missions instrument isn't there to kind of help that happen and what the lessons are for that kind of placement of missions above the ministry so that they actually help interministerial coordination. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Martin, you were the uh, uh, finance minister for Argentina, huge challenges in terms of actually negotiating the financial and fiscal space that's required then for an ambitious industrial strategy. Maybe just some reflections on the lessons learned on why we can't have these silos of kind of finance done in the Ministry of Finance, industrial strategy done in the Ministry for Innovation and industrial strategy, what it actually again means to join up that thinking. So what are we financing and how the structure of the finance itself can be part of that redirection of an economy. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, pleasure to be here and congratulations on such a successfully successful morning gathering. Um, so going back then to, to South America, uh, first definition, uh, industrial policies in South America are a necessity today. Uh, the region has been stagnated for about a decade after a decade of significant growth and economic and social progress. During the commodity boom, we saw growth in the region, uh, reductions in poverty, reductions in inequality, but what we also witnessed was uh, insufficient industrial policies. And we see the consequences now. The decade of stagnation that the, the region suffered from about 2012, 2013, means that today we have lack of hope in significant uh, fractions of the population, especially the youth, and that means more social fragmentation, more political fragmentation, and this also matters, as Alicia was explaining, for uh, any strategy for industrial policies. Uh, the region, of course, needs also green industrial policies, but frankly speaking, in this social context, that doesn't get too ingrained into the narratives. Uh, it's difficult to find the right representation of, of that approach. But that's not just a development need, it's also a balance of payment needs. If the uh, war moves in the direction of further carbon pricing, uh, and the region doesn't adapt on time, what we're going to see is more, a pattern with more instability. So industrial policies and green industrial policies are uh, necessary. Uh, that, of course, needs uh, financing, uh, as Marianne explained and as Alicia explained. And what we've seen, especially since 2008, when you look at the finance data in the region, we see a region that is more uh, exposed to debt. This is after the Lehman Brothers fall, the US financial crisis, and all the creation of liquidity uh, coming from, especially from the Fed, uh, meant that uh, there was more liquidity also flowing to uh, South America. And uh, the debt exposure is not just to any, it's particularly with the private sector, the domestic private sector uh, in the regions, in the region and the international private sector. So we have a, a region that is more exposed to capital that is going to be more unstable in a global context in which we see the Fed, the ECB, uh, increasing the interest rates, doing quantitative tightening. And uh, at the same time, that countries need more space, more financing space and more fiscal space to the industrial policies. What, what does this mean? It means first that there will be some countries that will need to do restructurings of the debt, and we've seen some of that happening. But then, uh, as Alicia explained, uh, we need to create more space in other ways. That's why uh, uh, changes in tax structures are important. And that's also why reallocation of spending is important, redefining priorities. But that's where the politics enters, right? Because in order to move forward with reallocation of spending, with changes in tax structures, you need the political strength, you need the power. And the political evolution in Latin America, even along the political spectrum, is different than what we're seeing now in other parts of the world. 
In other parts of the world, industrial policies today are the trend. We just explained Elizabeth's remarks for Europe. We had a brief discussion in the US. And even right-wing governments respect the role that the state, to some extent, that the state plays for pushing uh, uh, innovation uh, and increases in productivity. That's not the right wings we have in South America. The right wings we have in South America do not really endorse industrial policies. And this matters for the dynamics in the parliaments, uh, as Alicia explained. Last word, and we'll have more time to elaborate, uh, in terms of the institutional capabilities that we need, it's just one definition, I think, uh, state-owned enterprises should be uh, critical uh, agents for change in the region. And this is even more important in a context in which we see more instability of capital flows, of private capital flows, and more uh, uh, financing and fiscal constraints. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Wow, you really kept the time. <laughs> Um, so, Nimrod, your turn. Um, we just heard of the need also of this kind of institutional uh, redesign and also the political barriers for that. And of course, in South Africa, one of the big issues is the state-owned enterprise, ESCOM, what is maybe a new relationship, not just public-private, but public-public. We, we, when we talk about conditionalities, we often assume we're talking about business and the and the state kind of renegotiating, but actually there's different types of state institutions like state-owned enterprises that can be both a force for good, but also one of the problems. And what's a new relationship with the treasury, for example, between these different forms of uh, public entities, but also perhaps you can reflect on the other aspect that we just heard about in terms of the role of international finance, specifically multilateral development banks and helping to direct the finance in their own relationship with local state banks. So any one of these areas, feel free to pick up on and then we're going to open it up really to the floor just to have a, a wider, more dynamic conversation. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, um, and. Uh, Organizers, uh, and it's a great privilege to uh, participate in this discussion. Um, my colleague, I guess, um, Zukisi, uh, has touched quite a lot on the South African situation. And the way I'd like to frame my inputs is from a broader kind of African uh, context, and I can obviously uh, later elaborate on, on South Africa's. Uh, particularities. Um, so I think the, I mean, there are a couple of things. I think, uh, as you've said, uh, um, and many have said, there's a shift from the policy that will not be named to uh, an, an apparent widespread acceptance of, of industrial policy. Um, in this um, uh, kind of green uh, industrial and technological shift uh, that we're talking about, uh, the African continent is in uh, quite a perverse situation in that it accounts for less than 4% of the global stock of emissions, but it is likely to be disproportionately affected by the consequences of climate change, uh, not least uh, it with respect to water and uh, agriculture. Um, there, we've known for a long time that in order to meet the uh, SDG targets, uh, the continent needs a, in the order of around 200 billion rand, uh, 200 billion dollars of, of financing per annum. Um, and we also know that that is nowhere near being met um, from uh, the, the international community. Um, but simultaneously, the 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 uh, continent is effectively being um, asked to sterilize its coal, uh, oil, and gas resources. Um, it's subjected. It's being subjected to carbon border mechanisms um, on uh, some of its exports. Um, it is expected to not place restrictions on uh, the export of critical minerals um, and uh, after many decades of being told <coughs> excuse me, not to do industrial policy, um, we're now in a context of massive uh, subsidies and tax credits being uh, uh, made available uh, in the US and, 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 and the European Union. 
Um, having said that, African countries can't wait for the world to become a fairer place. So it's really critical to simultaneously exercise national and regional agency while making the case for more equitable treatment in the multilateral system. And there are very significant opportunities uh, for uh, structural transformation on the continent um, in the context of this uh, African continental free trade area um, that are linked to the green transition um, and include uh, a scope for or huge investment in renewable energy, um, absolutely critical to have investment in water and irrigation um, in the light of uh, climate change. Um, uh, and, and there are many opportunities for structural transformation in manufacturing, critically in agriculture, as well as leveraging uh, the mineral endowments uh, uh, on the continent. Um, the, the, I think the, the other dimensions of the uh, uh, context are also that um, the one of which of the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, has been a relative neglect of African development imperatives, um, uh, which is not to detract from, you know, the um, the uh, the you know the the uh, that particular the morality of uh, of, of that uh, uh, conflict. Um, um, and also, um, there is, as others have said, in the South American context in Africa, the uh, there's tremendous debt stress and austerity. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that, that is prevalent is that there's something akin to the Solo paradox. Um, so Solo said in the 1980s, you can see computers everywhere except, except in the productivity numbers. Um, I think one of the things we've seen and we can see it in South Africa is you can see industrial policy everywhere except in the budget. Um, so there's a real premium, I think, on looking at you know, what are the kind of institutions that can be brought to bear within this very challenging uh, context? I do believe that there are a number which include um, the critical role of development banks, um, how we use uh, the mining resources and, and leverage mining rights and resources, as well as intelligent use of uh, fiscal policy. Um, that's a mouthful already, so uh, perhaps we could come back to some of those issues in the discussion. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we were meant to have a bit of a discussion between us, but as we said, the whole point of mine is to talk with everyone. So why don't we actually just open up now? Is that is that okay, Nora? Just in terms of, um, we, we've touched on so many different issues, but I think one of the things that would be most useful is um, in terms of interacting on other experiences from people in the audience about these design challenges and these, again, both public private relationships, public public relationships, but also the political bottlenecks and of course the financial <laughs> bottlenecks of industrial strategies everywhere, but not in the budget, but also that issue of cross ministerial thinking, obviously any sort of you know, sustainability uh, uh, plan is not just for the Ministry of the Environment, it's for all uh, ministries to work together in new ways. We'll be in the next session looking also at the digital side of all of this. Uh, Mike Bracken, who set up GDS, uh, Government Digital Services, once said that the whole point of having this dynamic digital platform was actually to help the different departments to work together around problems, and yet that wasn't in the end what it was used for. Again, all sorts of incumbency and, and you know, different departments being very comfortable working in their silos, and even when you have a new dynamic digital platform that could enable that cross-departmental uh, 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 thinking, it then doesn't happen. So we really want to be reflecting on the bottlenecks, again, on the pain points, on the challenges that are being faced on the ground, but also the lessons and the opportunities. So why don't we open up? Feel free to, yep. And uh, I assume we have yeah, microphones and it would have been great if we could also have begun with a, a, you know, an introduction by everyone, but there's way too many of us, but this is the opportunity when you speak, please just tell us your name, where you're coming from, both in terms of country, but organization. Thank you. Hi, um, on the whole Scottish government, uh, first of all, great panel, thank you. I think there's a real theme here coming out about inequalities uh, and as someone who went to school in Lesotho in South Africa and um, you know, has a, a kind of touched base with various themes from, from around the world. The, what strikes me is how, to what extent are you going to use 
the likes of a global platform at COP28 mm -hmm. to draw attention to this and really push this agenda. You know, there's a global platform and you know, what, what's the strategy there, particularly from a, both at a national level, but then at a, a supranational level. Great, thanks so much. I think we should take about two or three um, and then we'll just bring it back to the panel. Can you just say again the organization? Yeah, the organization within the Scottish government. Uh, so um, I set up a program called CivTech. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so <laughs> government innovation program, uh, and I now run a, a set up a, a global network of government innovation teams called the CivTech Alliance. Yeah, and by the way, one of the things we're super interested in in IPP is precisely these kind of gov labs, like in Chile, Laboratorio de Gobierno or CivTechs, which create these safe places to be a bit crazy within government to test out some of these ideas. So it's your own experience has been really important also for our learning. Thank you. So other questions? You can take two more and then bring it back to the panel. Kate? I think it's more for the um, online. Great, so I'm Kate Roll. Um, I'm a, on faculty at, at IAPP, and part of my portfolio is teaching. So my question for the panel is, for our MPA students, for folks who are entering the workforce, um, what are the skills, what are the, the capabilities they need mm. to be able to deal with these challenges you're talking about around green transition, industrial policy, all of that? What should be in the curriculum from your perspective? Thank you. Love it, thank you. And Kate's gonna be leading a session later today helping us think about that more explicitly. So one more, and then we'll bring it back to the panel, and then we'll take another three. Dan. Uh, I'm Dan, also from IIPP, but I'm also taking the questions from online. So we have uh, a, a question from Arik online, um, who asks, well, who says, uh, we need to implement a green industrial policy, but how can we do that in the context um, of developing countries in the global south like my country, Indonesia. Um, I think the panel has touched on this. Um, and it goes on, Indonesia has fiscal limitations and is also still dependent on foreign direct investment. So it's very difficult to expect public investment like in the United States or the EU. So some reflections on the challenges of financing industrial policy in global South countries. Yeah, and it's a great question. And um, as you might know, IPP is quite involved in the Bridgetown initiative being led by people like Mia Motley, who's precisely reflecting on, yeah, this all sounds great, but if we don't have the fiscal space and it doesn't happen. So what are the changes we need in global finance to create that fiscal space? Great. So we have one on inequality and how we can bring um, these ideas that reflected on in the panel to COP28 to actually see action. One from uh, Kate around the skills needed uh, for the curriculum around these issues and um, the, the fiscal uh, space problems that developing countries currently have, which was touched on, but we can think about it more. Which, Mizu? So sure. thanks. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll just pick um, a few. Uh, the, I, I'm glad Nimrod raised the issue of budge, budgeting. Um, it, it was at the back of my mind and I was mm -hmm. kind of feeling bad that I didn't mention it. But uh, I mean, back to the point of missions, uh, Mariana, the, you know, I was thinking as he was speaking that if you want to know what a country's missions are, look at its budget. Uh, and, you know, you, as long as you don't have, I mean, we talk about social compacts as in government, you know, the state, uh, government, the market and, and society. But uh, in many developing countries, you find a lack of cohesion within the state. Uh, the uh, fractions of the state that um, have antipathy towards industrial policy because they uh, are scared of this idea of a big state. Uh, and, and also they, they lack internal self-confidence uh, of what is possible through, through the state. And, and, and a country like South Africa and, and some other countries are, are quite endowed in their possession of development finance institutions, large state-owned enterprises. Um, and, and of course, I mean, there are deficiencies in terms of how they are they are governed, uh, the, you know, the management of, of these entities. And, and this opens a flank for those who uh, want to drive private privatization. And, and I'm hoping that later on uh, Nimrod, because he sits on the board of one of this um, development, in fact, one of the major development finance institutions in South, South Africa, uh, how you mobilize, uh, you know, you, you, you rethink the mission of these entities and mobilize uh, uh, resources. And perhaps uh, lastly, the, 
uh, I like the question about the curriculum. The, we are thinking about these questions at, uh, I think it was raised by Kate at the, at the Vet School of Governance because it's, it's clear to us that the new economy that we are seeking to, to build, you know, the, a digitally, a, a digitally um, transformed and a green economy will require a new set of skills, especially among public officials. And, and for me, you know, my observation is that uh, one, I think it's very important to, to teach political economy uh, the some of the tensions in society and how uh, to think about instruments to overcome this, but also the complementarities between a wide set of uh, institutional tools, uh, fiscal, uh, monetary, uh, and perhaps less monetary because it's highly contested area, but perhaps this opens up an avenue to, to think differently about monetary policy, uh, trade policies, industrial policies, and, and social and labor market policies as part of a political economy package. Secondly, uh, digital governance and managing green innovations, uh, setting how to set conditionalities um, for uh, private sector agencies. And, and uh, it's one thing to set conditionalities, but it's another to develop capabilities for effective monitoring and evaluation uh, in South Africa. This is one of our deficiencies. We've in the past given a lot of uh, direct state support to manufacturing companies, either you know, R&D, tax credits, uh, some form of subsidies, uh, you know, certain state guarantees, but you don't see the, the outcomes. You set local content requirements uh, and there's a pushback against local content requirements. They tell you that the thresholds are very high local capabilities do not exist but you know they don't say there's no timetable that is you know over the next five years this is the sort of you know local cap so so this uh, so setting a program a curriculum that is um emphasizes on um political economy setting conditionalities m and e as well as you know, conceptually how a, a digital transformation and green innovation should look like and, and how the you know state actors should or can work uh, with market agents because it, that culture don't exist. There's always a conflict between the two. They don't see themselves sitting around the table but sitting across across each other. And perhaps there is a, a space for that when you set the disciplines, i.e. the conditionalities. But yeah. a lot of the times you have to co-shape uh, you know, the, the, the new the new economy. Thanks. Thank you. And by the way, you'll see in the agenda um, that there's a breakout session where we're going to kind of do a deep dive into that. So there's a every table will be considering how do we rethink state capacity in the face of grand challenges and industrial strategies and what are the capacities and competencies that we need today and how are we building them or not building them. Um, I wanted just to go back to Elizabeth because I know it's hard when you're online to get a word in <laughs> and, and to Nimrod and then we'll have Alicia and Martin. Did you want to? Yeah. Many, many thanks. I mean, just a few thoughts on the different questions and um, actually also the earlier intervention. First of all, on the um, mission objective. So for us, it has been very clear that the green and digital transition are the overarching priority. And the approach we took was a whole of government approach um, with very clear multi-annual commitment. As I, as I said in my statement, also this um, becoming climate neutral has been set in law. And, and we really put that out for several years to achieve it and then all kinds of policies um, have been geared, have been steered, have been modified to go into that direction. So that's not perhaps industrial strategy, but I think it's important if you want to achieve an objective that there is the political commitment and the agreement to do this over a number of years. The second thing, um, and it's also something where you don't need um, directly spending or fiscal capacity, it's the importance of the supply chains, the importance of robust, diversified supply chains, which for us was really um, 
a, a key moment behind the Green Deal industrial plan thinking that came about behind also the CHIPS Act thinking to reduce over dependencies on suppliers and to have um, resilience built into our supply chains. Uh, actually, that links me or allows me to make a link to the question that was made about COP28. Um, because for us, uh, and, and that's why also I thought that it has actually worked over the short term that we have applied it, the renewable energy deployment and the energy savings. Because I think that's so crucial for, for the climate objectives, but it actually helps you because you have a local production of energy. If you have renewable energy, you become independent. Um, you have a diversified supply of energy you produce locally and your marginal costs are very very low so for even us in the eu we would expect that if we achieve our renewable energy targets the electricity prices would go down they're very high today which is a, a problem for industrial competitiveness um, on the global scale um, but we do expect them to come down and that will hopefully turn into an advantage. So energy savings and deployment of um, production of renewable energy in a diversified way, I think is very, very important also for, for underpinning the whole um, industrial um, tissue of, of companies. Um, I would also emphasize really as a um, low cost way of doing economic policy, the importance of a good and, and flexible regulatory framework with, with stable underlying um, principles of the rule of law, um, uh, courts, um, as, as something that is key to attract investment. Um, we have seen a key role also of infrastructure in attracting investments um, and we are now experimenting with regulatory sandboxes um, to have inbuilt in our regulation possibilities to experiment with new technologies in a super wide, supervised way. So not only tackling the risks, but actually allowing um, innovation, allowing piloting of certain new technologies to take place. I think that's an extremely important part also of economic and industrial policy. So that's not only about spending, although of course um, using public money wisely to, to de-risk private investment um, will continue to be also key. Um, knowing that the amounts are so vast that um, private um, funding will be bearing the brunt of the transformation and um, as said, using the public spending then wisely to multiply. Back to you. Thank you. I'd like to come back to that idea of sandboxing when um, Alice and Nimrod come back in, just to maybe give us some example of sandboxes where you tried something precisely in order to change these relationships that we're talking about and what the experience was and how you perhaps also then scaled up some of these experiments. But first, to address the question from Indonesia, uh, Martin, if maybe you can just come back in on this question of a uh, fiscal space, but again with examples of, of what you tried to do. And, and, and the, the, the global architecture, right, yeah. for, for financing uh, industrial policies. Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, the, first, I think it's important to look at where financing comes from for each country or region that mm -hmm. engages into industrial policies. Where does the financing for industrial policies comes from uh, in Europe? mainly from Europe, in the US, from the US, in China, from China, right? So that's a reality. In the case of South America, uh, the, the financing issues and the financing needs are not going to be resolved by Wall Street, by the IMF, uh, by even by China. Uh, the region needs its own financing and that's why it's so important to uh, develop or enhance the role of uh, regional uh, development banks. Uh, but the f problem is that there are parts of the world today, especially the global south, that is largely exposed to debt from elsewhere. We are seeing a debt crisis today in the global south. And uh, the international financial architecture is highly deficient in terms of providing solutions 
to uh, situations of uh, unsustainable debt burdens. Uh, Mariana mentioned the Bridgetown Initiative uh, uh, led by Mia Motley, which is an important one. And uh, what it shows is that uh, we don't have an architecture that is uh, functional today. Uh, and, and we we do need uh, reforms, but those reforms are not going to happen anytime soon. So I think uh, domestic uh, economies, each country will have to uh, face the uh, financing situations that they face uh, and in some cases, restructured debts. Another important piece of the global architecture that we should look at, also when we look at the financing side, is the uh, international tax architecture. One of the main problems that we face for doing industrial policies is the problem of tax havens. Uh, in Argentina, when I was the Minister of Economy, I pushed a, a, a reform to the wealth tax basically a, a reenactment of the wealth tax and that led to an increase in tax revenues of 0.7 percent of gdp which in argentina is sizable our main problem was the issue of tax havens and the fact that we cannot observe who are the uh, beneficial owners in bank accounts uh, in, in those uh, tax jurisdictions so that really undermines the capacity of financing uh, industrial policies in the region. So we need a, a comprehensive approach when it comes to changing the, the global architecture. It focuses on debt, focuses on taxes, and it also focuses on the issue of property rights. Thank you. Uh, Alicia and Nimrod, maybe some examples of, again, whether it's regulatory sandboxes, tax policy sandboxes, procurement sandboxes, anything that you want to reflect on from the actual experience on the ground, also when you were in CEPAL, of helping to steer some of these new policies. No, very good. And, and I just wanted to say for COP28 that I believe that there has to be a serious discussion of loss and damages and how that is going to be funded. Secondly, I guess that the special drawing rights, um, Mia Motley proposed that uh, special drawing rights be issued again every year and be earmarked for climate change and basically for adaptation, which is a problem of the Caribbean. And one of the things we were trying was to have a debt for climate initiative in the sense that uh, uh, the Caribbean countries in particular should be in certain way consider to have a, a sort of a resilience fund uh, and, and to have a debt cut that could go precisely for a resilience fund to have some concrete projects on, re, I would say, projects of infrastructure to mitigate climate change, but indeed to adapt to climate change mm -hmm. and, and, and also to, to make aware that whenever they are going to take debt, there has to be a, a hurricane clause, for example, included. So if there's a hurricane, there should be a, a moratorium of debt. Things of that sort, we were designing some of these instruments for the Caribbean countries. In terms of a sandbox, let me give you one very concrete example. After the pandemics, and precisely a lesson from the pandemics was that our region was very highly dependent on vaccines and medicaments and everything. So uh, the 33 countries agreed to put together a plan that is called the self-sufficiency health plan. And what it entails is that the six entities that have regulatory level four in, in WHO could come together and try to build a platform to have a sort of a, a, a EMA like you have in Europe. That is a platform of regulatory entities that could approve medicaments or pharmaceuticals and one that is approved in Mexico could be used in Chile or could be used in at least in the countries that are registered at, at the four, at level four. And this is working now. Uh, these have, there are six countries now that are trying to put together what they are calling a, a Latin American agency of medicaments. And this is coming from a regulatory process. They are coming together to see if they can in certain way have a same methodology for certification. Secondly, to identify the companies 
and the, the, and the universities, by the way, because there are many, that are uh, capable of producing uh, pharmaceuticals. And, uh, and, and we have made an inventory of all these institutions, including both transnational and national, because the region lost capabilities to produce vaccines, for example, industrially, and they prefer to buy instead of produce. But now they want to recover the capability to produce uh, pharmaceuticals. So I think this is very interesting initiative. And the final thing is that they want to negotiate uh, the property rights and the patents to see, for example, if a biotech, Pfizer biotech, because they just, BioNTech, I'm sorry, they said already that they were ready to liberate some of the patents as for, for the developing countries to produce. So that's, that's a whole line, a whole industrial line that is happening in Latin America and the Caribbean, not all, all the region, but at least in some key countries like Mexico, Colombia, uh, Cuba, Argentina, and Brazil. I believe that Brazil is going to be a, is going to become a very powerful again uh, uh, machine uh, engine for uh, for industrial policy because they do have the national bank, as you know, Mariana de Benedese. They have all the instruments and the capability. Brazil has a tremendous capability to produce medicines, to produce food. And, and, and so self-sufficiency is something that these countries are looking for after the pandemics was so harsh in terms of demonstrating that if you don't have the capability, you stay out. And, um, and also I think uh, in, in the sense in energy, I guess there's again, I would say not so advanced. I mean, I think in the health industry, we are much more advanced than in the, at least in the discussion and the debate including the private sector, because the private sector wants to come in. I mean, the, the, the Latin American private sector, but also uh, companies like Pfizer, companies like Moderna, they are ready to come to invest in, the, in our region and, and to make sure that we can, uh, we can really uh, have a more developed industry in, in health. So I think this is a good example, Mariana, of how when com countries come together, have a political, well, they had a problem, pandemics, they had a, a dependency, they had a lot of uh, dead people because our region with 8.4% of a population had more than 35% of the fat of the people died. So this region was really badly affected. So um, there was a, a lot of thinking of how to get out of this uh, dependency in the, in the sense of health. Great, thank you. Um, Nimrod, and I'm going to add ten, uh, uh, some time to the session because we started late and we don't need the full 65 minutes, I think, for the breakout. Is that okay, Nora? Are you okay with that? Because we started late, yeah? Uh, Nimrod? Um, yes, thanks. Um, there's so many uh, issues raised and um, um, let me try and uh, kind of uh, bind some of them together. Um, so there was a question raised by Alex, I think, um, about uh, the approach to COP28 um, and uh, uh, developing countries using that to push for concessional financing for the Green Coalition. South Africa has, um, has, has, has been doing that um, and uh, in COP, uh, COP26 uh, secured in principle uh, commitment to uh, financing package um, that has translated into uh, what is called the Just Energy Transition Investment Plan, um, which is supported by a, a package of $8.5 billion of financing um, from a number of countries, including uh, uh, European countries, notably Germany. Um, uh, I think there are some issues, though, around uh, that is a very necessary and welcome steps, uh, undoubtedly. Um, uh, there are issues about whether the scale is adequate. Um, we, we certainly know that, that it's not, um, as well as the structure. Um, there certainly are ele elements of concessionality, but, um, you know, um, uh, of the package, um, which is, is, is very welcome. Um, but, but, but the degree of concessionality 
uh, of these types of packages I think needs to be um, raised. Um, I, I think there's a parallel, a bit of a danger that um, that which which relates to the points I think made by uh, Martin in particular that um, you know that these types of mechanisms should not um, detract from some of the changes that need to be made to the global financial architecture, including dealing with the issues of tax havens um, uh, and and uh, the capital outflows um, uh, that uh, uh, from regions like uh, South America and, and, and Africa to those tax havens, um, uh, the development of additional uh, instruments, the use of SDRs and uh, debt for climate uh, type of arrangements, and other financing instruments. Um, so I think that what that suggests once again is that you know it's kind of a battle on, on, on two fronts, if you like. The one is at the international level, but the other is also saying you know what are the institutions and instruments that can really be brought to bear, um, recognizing that there is profound skepticism many quarters about the role of the state and the role of public institutions um, and often that skepticism is very well founded um, and um, uh, you know anyone who knows a little bit about the South African situation knows you know that the state national state utility ESCOM um, uh, has uh, you know that we're in a profound energy crisis in that institution um, to some extent I think there are um, uh, there, there are innovations, if you like, or contributions from other institutions. The, the Industrial Development Corporation, for instance, uh, has played quite a significant role in compensating, if you like, for some of the failures of you know of, of ESCOM by being a major investor in uh, private renewable energy projects. And, and helping to demonstrate uh, the viability um, of those uh, private renewable energy projects in the South African energy system. Um, so again, you know, I think there was quite a strong theme. Uh, again, also similarly uh, raised by the colleagues in relation to Latin America about the importance of development banks. Um, in fact, and 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 in and also in relation to fiscal austerity um, uh, or um, uh, kind of limits on on the budget, uh, whether they are truly necessary or not, is, is can be debated. But for instance, my understanding of why the uh, European Investment Bank was established was partly to help resolve the tension between the need to invest in infrastructure. Uh, uh, in Europe, but not breach the the the, the deficit ceiling of three uh, percent uh, of GDP. So you know, how do you solve, if you like, the political problem? And, and that was what one of the reasons why the EIB has come to play such a prominent role in the place um, is, uh, you know, to try and as uh, as, a, as a solution to that problem. So. Um, uh, African development banks, I think, are uh, really uh, are exceptionally important institutions, um, and uh, but there's a need uh, to uh, to to restructure um, and for them to play a much more significant role, um, and that also needs to recognise that there are some uh, which are quite effective and, and capable, um, uh, and then there are many that are you know. Uh, less capable, not least because there are too many. Um, in 55 countries in Africa, um, there are about 90 developers by number of the world's development banks, but collectively African development banks account for about 1% of development bank assets worldwide. So there's a real need for thing and, and also probably for consolidation. Um, uh, into uh, uh, kind of regional and even sub-regional consolidation um, uh, in the space, and then working very closely with um, uh, with, with international um, multi-development banks, with private the private financial sector, 
Um, and I think also framing uh, this, uh, one of this issue of de-risking, um, you know, and precisely what and who ought to be de-risked. I think where developing banks have a tremendously positive role to play is that, you know, they're good at, uh, at their best at de-risking projects, sectors, programs, um, and that's what needs de-risking. Um, the, you know, the investment projects themselves, rather than individual investors, um, you know, regardless of the succession of, uh, of, a, of a development project. Um, so again, many, many issues, uh, I think, which, which kind of... Uh, Thank you. Uh, really interesting. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN um, has written something called the stimulus. Uh, what's it called? The UN, the the SDG stimulus, where they reflect actually on the huge amounts of money that's currently locked in both MDBs, the multilateral development banks, but also the national state investment banks, which have together just the latter. So national state investment banks, 2.5 trillion uh, dollars worth of funds. The MDBs together have 500 uh, billion, and the idea of actually having much greater alignment of them around again, climate, digitalization, health preparedness, and again, embedding within those loan programs, progressive as opposed to, as opposed to dysfunctional conditionalities, that lack of fiscal space, which you also found yourself fighting as Minister of Finance, have often been created actually by loan programs. Now, the old conditions of the IMF and the World Bank that were conditional on reducing deficits as opposed to actually creating capable strategic states and what are the conditions both in terms of the capacity but also that new public private alignment around these kind of big global missions i mean that's that's really a huge issue uh, so can i just thank this wonderful panel